Hello everyone, I'm James Milan, and this is Million Dollar Gift, a series as, which, as you know, focuses on the efforts of volunteers and people putting uh, the work in behind the scenes for all, for all of our benefit. And we like to highlight those issues uh, as often as we can. And of course, right now, in what we call pandemic times around here, uh, that is more important than ever. Today, I get to talk to Elizabeth Greenhall, who is the Vice President at uh, Project Bread. She's in charge of communication and development. Uh, Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, James. Uh, and we just wanna talk about the work of Project Bread um, and how, of course, it has been affected as, we, as all of our work is mm -hmm. uh, by the current circumstances. Um, I'd like to start by just asking you, you know, I think a lot of our audience would be familiar, of course, with Project Bread as an entity, possibly without knowing anything about what you actually do, um, <laughs> mostly because, of course, of the high profile of the Walk for Hunger each year. I've mm -hmm. taken part in it three or four times myself over the Thank years. Thank you. I've always been supportive and with good reason. Um, but tell us a little bit, first of all, what does Project Bread do? Sure, so Project Bread, um, the walk is just a part of, of our organization, um, but it is where our roots are and, and sort of how the organization came to be. Um, and the walk ultimately is about, you know, a commitment to taking care of one another um, and to, you know, coming together as a community to, to lift the, the larger group up as a whole. Um, and so as, um, after the walk, which was founded in 1969, had um, been through some years of doing it, it just became so clear that um, there was a lot more that needed to be done um, and a lot of expertise uh, with people closely associated with the walk um, that Project Bread began expanding beyond um, the fundraising component. Right, basically, the, right, being a fundraiser, right. Mm -hmm. Right. And so today, um, we really act uh, to connect people with resources um, and have a big focus on federal nutrition programs like the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, which is SNAP or formerly called Food Stamps. Um, and uh, in addition to other programs, school meals, um, summer meal, free summer meals for kids and teens. Um, and our approach is really about solutions that are focused on um, families, kids, and communities, um, and trying to make sure that there's a sustainable way to, to support these, these uh, folks who are struggling to afford food right now. Yeah, and you know, um, we uh, have spoken some, to some other folks in the last couple of weeks about the fact that there are a lot of different front lines, one might say, um, in in you know yeah. our collective fight against this pandemic, mm -hmm. and you are certainly on one of them. The food, the programs that you mentioned that you're already heavily involved in, summer lunches for kids or food, you know, provide provision for kids in the summer at school, the SNAP program, et cetera. All of these things have been directly affected and dramatically so um, by. The current situation. Um, right. So let's let's talk a little bit about uh, the food insecurity mm, ramifications of what we we are all going through. Um, let me just invite you to 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 start to walk us through uh, what it is that we what you are already looking at and facing, but what we also are looking at as this moves forward from here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think to start, it's it's worth just noting that this is completely unprecedented. You know, Project Bread has been serving the community for um, in the state of Massachusetts for over 50 years, and and in all of um, those years, we have never seen anything like this. Um, but before the uh, coronavirus arrived in in Massachusetts. We already had a pretty significant problem with hunger um, that often went unnoticed. Um, and so, you know, in February, if you were asking me what hunger looked like in Massachusetts, we would say it was impacting about nine percent of people in our state, and um, and that makes that works out to about um, one in eleven households or one in nine kids. Um, so far too many. Large, large number. I mean, if you know that that's 
it is thousand people or more i'm sure absolutely and when you consider that that massachusetts is you know a wealthy state in a wealthy nation um well resourced like well educated um it's really unacceptable um that we are kind of in that position and of course with um the situation that we're in right now we're we're seeing this problem um that that was certainly there um be you know acceler accelerated and, and exaggerated in a very short window of time so um some research that was supported by the usda just came out um around food insecurity in Massachusetts since in the month of March. And, and it was about 38% of people who were saying that they, you know, were food insecure. And, and um, just for your viewers, when we talk about food insecurity, what we mean is um, people who have some uncertainty around where their next meal will come from. They, they can't, you know, reliably say with confidence that, that they will um, have, you know, whatever that next meal may be. Thank you for that. You anticipated my question perfectly. Um, and I do think it is really important that people understand what that means concretely. Food insecurity means literally that at some point or in some way, families are not sure or people are not sure where their next meal is coming from. Right. And I mean, you can imagine the implications that that has on, you know, the stress on a family, um, other long-term like health and, and economic outcomes. Um, and so I think when we think about Massachusetts as a community, um, it's really important to recognize that it's not just that individual experience of the person who might be struggling, but it's the whole family unit and then the whole community. Um, and, and as a result, you know, our state um isn't we're not reaching our full potential right and we can't achieve the equity um that we want until we can make sure that everyone has the food they need to thrive mm -hmm. you know you were uh you have already mentioned the snap program and um one of the things that that has really struck us in some conversations that we have had recently is the idea that, for instance, um, if food pantries are um, under, in, in, let, let's say, in higher demand than they, again, an unprecedented situation. Yeah, it's like depression era as red well. lines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, when, what we've heard that has really struck us is that there are stigmas attached, of course, to, to both going to a food pantry or, uh, you know, um, enrolling in the SNAP program or in, in what people mm -hmm. had traditionally called food stamps. And as between those two things, it seems from what we've heard that people are more, uh, are, have a bigger problem with enrolling in the SNAP program than with going to a food pantry. Curious about, you know, whether you have any idea or explanation for why that is. Um, and also what we can do about that. Right, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a really interesting topic. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that Project Bread, before, you know, we went into crisis mode had been looking at is, is really starting to unpack those barriers and understanding, um, you know, misconceptions or um, fear of um, perceived stigma um, around programs um, that were intended to support people. And, and I think um, on the, and, and this is, you know, anecdotal, but, but I think what we hear on the side on food pantry is that that is like a community-based program. Um, and, um, and so in many cases, you know, people feel, um, you know, a sense of, uh support or or mm -hmm. potentially like an intimacy with the organization just to be, feel understood um on the flip side you know i've definitely talked to um families where there's a kid in in high school who doesn't want to go to the food pantry because he's afraid somebody's going to recognize him his classmates are volunteering yeah exactly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and when it comes to stigma around snap i think um it's hard to it's hard to quantify 
Um, but I will say that SNAP isn't well understood. Um, and so a lot of people confuse SNAP with welfare, um, which are, you know, very different things. Um, and uh, I think that the SNAP program, you know, feels like official in some way because it is a federal nutrition program. Um, and so um, I think that people feel like they're somehow like putting down on their record, you know, that they're struggling or, or it's, it's, um, you know, it's, it's difficult to uh, kind of overcome that barrier. But I, I think what we want people to understand is that um, SNAP is proven as the most effective anti-hunger solution that we have. Um, it achieves a scale that is, you know, untouched by any other um, program. And um, it brings money into the Massachusetts economy because it's federally funded. Um, it gives people the purchasing power to choose their own food. You know, if you, if you wanna buy the food that's, you know, we all want comfort food right now. Um, but comfort food to me is different than comfort food, maybe from someone, you know, with a different um, heritage or background. And so we want people to be able to purchase and, and the food that they, that it makes most sense for them, whether that's cultural relevancy or to accommodate any um, dietary restrictions in the home. Um, and really that's kind of the, the beauty of SNAP is that it does, um, it's not putting people in a position where they're asking for ch charity. It's, it's actually giving people um, the financial resources to, to purchase their own food and in a way that's most convenient to them, whether that's um, you know, at, at a, a big supermarket or at, you know, a corner store. Mm -hmm. um, if you work odd shifts, you know, you can do it at night or whenever you want. Um, I think there are a lot of barriers on the um, emergency food side, on the food pantry system, because um, it is so volunteer dependent that, that they're struggling right now um, because we got to keep everyone safe. Um, and so, our feeling at Project Bread is that there's a number of people who are visiting food pantries right now um, who don't know that they're eligible for SNAP, um, have never found themselves in a place where they're looking for assistance in the way that they are now and maybe have no familiarity with what's available. Um, and we really want to help people understand that this is a program that exists, it's proven, it helps lift people out of poverty, um, and and um, it's sustainable, right? You don't have to keep going to a food pantry, um, figuring out that transportation piece. It's uh, the majority of it's happening electronically. Right. And so, who is um, and how does one uh, recognize that that you who is eligible for the program? And and to those who might be again concerned about perceived stigma, as you were. Uh, alluded to before, uh, is our applications, you know, the whole application process, is privacy assured or secured? Um, yeah, um, so I think, you know, on the eligibility question, like all things, it depends. Um, but I would say um, there are, like, that's reason, that's one of the reasons that organizations like Project Bread exist, is to, um, you know, help people who are are curious about what resources might be available to them. So you can call Project Bread and, you know, we can quickly pre-screen you for SNAP. So you know whether it's worth, you know, going through that application process. You have support through the application. I mean, anyone who's applied for unemployment mm -hmm. or um, tried to do their own taxes, government paperwork, um, is can be really challenging. And, and um, especially so if it's not in your native language. Um, and so Project Bread really helps people find out um, the maximum amount of supports that they are because, you know, we know that we need comprehensive um, supports for people. So we, you know, if you call us and we pre-screen you and you're eligible for SNAP, we'll help you through that application process. And we'll also talk to you about um, free, free meals for kids um, that are near you. We can tell you about food pantries that are open or closed during this period of time. Um, so really we help people navigate 
what resources are, are available to them. And, and that eligibility piece is tricky um, for, for a lot of folks. And, and that's one of the ways that, that we help. Okay, so I mean, the an answer in part, as you said, is it, it varies a lot, but you, Project Bread, great resource for to figure out whether one is eligible. Um, yeah, and, and um, I would say that, you know, on one, so two things. Um, one, I think there's a lot of opportunity right now to, um, in, to really push for making SNAP something that's eligible for, that more people are eligible the broad, for, right? right? The broadest possible scope, yeah. Exactly. Um, so I think people who can should, should um, you know, try to educate themselves and, and do whatever they can to advocate for that. Um, but then, um, on the eligibility piece for those who might be, um, you know, needing assistance right now, there are some resources out there on Project Bread's um, website. We have, you know, some basic information that can help kind of uh, let you know if it's um, a good place for you to start or, or not. But again, I, I think that when you're in crisis, there's nothing that compares to having a kind, non-judgmental person on the other end of the phone, which is, um, or the chat, <laughs> which is what we do at Project Brain. That's fantastic, I gotta say. Uh, as a brief aside, just dealing uh, recently as I have been on behalf of an older relative with just starting to weed or wade into Medicare, boy, could I use a resource like that, you know, so I can really appreciate what it is that you are offering. Um, I'm wondering, of course, you guys would have thought about this and made provisions for it. Non-English speakers and, and immigrants who might be wanting to, um, or non-English, non non-native English speakers, I should say. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, who would be wanting to apply. I assume that you, you, you can, can meet those needs as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so great question. And I think it's a really important point that not everyone thinks about. And um, I, I think we all have a responsibility to be thinking about it. Um, which is that, you know, hunger before COVID-19 was here, you know, we already talked about that this is a real challenge that exists in Massachusetts. And we know that, um, that certain communities and certain demographics are disproportionately impacted by it. So where that, you know, it's one in um, 11 households that rings true when you look at the state average in certain mm -hmm. communities, you know, it's one in three households. Much higher, right. So it's really, um, it's really important to be thinking that through, especially people who have, you know, the power or influence to be informing the, the response. Um, and at Project Red, we do a couple things um, to help drive that um, sort of more equitable or more intentionally equitable planning and, and process. So um, we are always making all our, our resources available in multiple languages and, and doing the promotion and, and awareness building around those resources in multiple languages, um, trying to connect with people, as many people as possible. You know, our site is available in English and Spanish, and then we have um, translation services for 160 languages through our home. Really? Yeah. yeah. Um, and Boston, like one of the great things about, about you know, B greater Boston and, and the state of Massachusetts is um, how many cultures, you know. Right. Are, Cultural are, and linguistic diversity, it's pretty good for this. It's side very side. good, yes. <laughs> um, and so we want to recognize that and, and give support that's really tailored to, to people. So, you know, when you're in crisis, you want to have um, as few barriers as possible. Um, but then the other piece that, that we are doing is, you know, trying to find opportunities um, to create platforms for people who are living um, with this experience right now or experiencing food insecurity to inform the policy and programmatic response. Um, I think that for a long time, um, hunger along with many other things has been something that the solutions have been very one directional and, and usually, you know, um, uh, like it's generally older white men that are, have been driving this policy. Absolutely. Um, and so I think, you know, it's really uh, critical that we recognize that, 
you know, the best way to, to support someone is to ask what they need um, and then help figure out how to get it, um, how, how to get it to them. And so um, being really intentional about um, community engagement is, is important. And then also research. So um, looking at uh, patterns of hunger and food insecurity in Massachusetts over the past 50 years. Um, Project Bread is located in East Boston. So we um, are definitely, you know, well aware of some of the barriers that exist um, in communities where there's a lot of gentrification happening. Um, so really uh, thinking from a, from, you know, both a tactical and, and on the ground level, but then also making sure that that's getting turned around and, and brought back into the policy conversations. Yeah, speaking of policy conversations, I'm curious um, about, you know, the mix of uh, programs that you guys um, help people to navigate. Um, I assume that there is a mix between those that are administered by the state and those that are administered by the federal government. Mm -hmm. um, are, do you find or are you finding in the current moment um, that it is easier uh, to work with or either of those entities is uh, being more flexible as seems required at this time? Um, mm -hmm. And I guess what I'm really asking in some ways is <laughs> the federal government's role in all of this has not been very impressive so far. <laughs> How has your experience been with that, I guess, and, and also with the state government administered program? Yeah, absolutely. So for um, a number of these programs are administered at the state level, um, but funded federally. Um, so I think that, you know, it's, um, it's sort of a blended uh, answer, I would, I guess I would say, I'll say that Massachusetts just as a state has um, incredible leadership in this area. So really the national leaders on responding to the hunger crisis coming out of, or not, not like we're coming out of it, but um, mm -hmm. resulting from, from the COVID-19 pandemic are our congressional leaders. So um, Congresswoman Ayanna Pressley, um, Congressman Jim McGovern has been a, a national voice on food insecurity. Um, the entire time he's been in, in office. Right, um, right, much longer than this, than we've been dealing with this pandemic. That's absolutely, right. Congressman Kennedy. Um, so I think that there's a lot to be said um, for, you know, using, whole, lifting Massachusetts up as an example of ways to make these things work. Um, I, I think that uh, pandemic so something called pandemic EBT has has recently been approved. The governor announced it, mm -hmm. um, and this is something that provides funds to that are federal funds to families um, who normally are eligible to receive free or reduced price meals at school. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, Massachusetts was one of just a handful of states that actually applied to receive this funding. And um, you know, ultimately, when it when it does roll out, it's it's going to reach um, you know over five hundred thousand kids um, and bring you know four million dollars into our state economy. And and I think we really have to applaud the collaborative leadership um, here in Massachusetts. You know, I, I think regardless of um, how you think about things or how you thought about things before or you know perceived like dramatic differences in um, policy agenda it's really clear right now that um, people in the community are getting put first and and that our state is is out ahead leading on this and and trying to kind of setting an example and and showing in real life what the potential impact of these programs can be you know, never a bad time to pause to applaud uh, anything, but boy, right now, you know, more than ever. So that that really is, it's, it's wonderful to hear. Uh, not only, again, that there is collaboration afoot, um, but also that it's going to have, and more importantly, that it will uh, potentially have such concrete um, and direct results um, to, to, to attend to the needs of people that really deserve it. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's, you know, I do this all the time and I'm, I'm like continually just um, excited about 
um, the how much Massachusetts is pushing for. It's really nice. Yeah, it's it's we're we're doing okay in this state. You know, by by being residents of this state, I have to say. That's right. Um, a uh, couple more things. One um, actually goes back to something you said earlier, and that was when you were talking about, um, you know, people going to food pantries versus, not versus, but yep. pantries and the SNAP program, et cetera. Um, and you were saying that one of the virtues of SNAP is that it does give people the means and allow them to make the choices of what food they want for themselves. Of course, that's a great thing. And right in line with our American values, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, it also made me think, hmm, how good are those choices going to be sometimes when you mm -hmm. are giving those choices over to all the individuals? Are they going to choose well? Mm -hmm. um, does Project Bread get involved at all with um, providing counsel or advice or guidance around healthy eating and healthy choices in the supermarket um, with your food stamps or otherwise, you know, your yep. program or otherwise? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a good question. Um, for us, I think, you know, we believe that people can, can make that choice for themselves and like the best thing to do is to make information available. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, I think that trying to limit how prescriptive we are is going to make it easier for more people um, to access and use the program. Um, and I think, you know, when it comes to health, a lot of us know what's healthy and what's not healthy and still make, you know, like, <laughs> I might enough. be living on ice cream right now, um, <laughs> but stress eating. Um, and so I think like giving people the, the right to make those decisions for themselves is is part of how we think about it but definitely there is an education component to make sure that that information and those resources on healthy eating are available and and a lot of our partners do that very well and um we try to do we try to influence the health factor around these programs um, primarily through the schools so working with school districts to make sure that those free meals that are provided um are quality food and, and, you know, um, can help, uh, meet the, the nutrition, um, needs for kids during the day, especially a lot of kids count on school food for half of their daily mm -hmm. work into right. making sure those calories count. Yeah. And I, I just want to clarify that in asking that question, I wasn't assuming, believe me, that you guys were being prescriptive in any way. I just wondered whether, again, there was yeah, no, absolutely kind of element it's, of education, as you were saying. For sure. And, and, um, and I think that's actually, you know, it's an interesting point. It's sometimes a tension point in the anti-hunger um, community, just from a strategic standpoint. Um, but we're really about access and affordability. Um, and I think, um, you know, the, we don't, um, I think we know that there are others who are better suited probably than we are. Um, as I just admitted, I had ice cream for, for dinner last <laughs> night. So, um, I didn't know you were actually, <laughs> I thought that was all theoretical. No. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's theoretical. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know that, that, that Project Bread itself is not, um, you know, it, not um, in any substantial sense a volunteer organization and that mm -hmm. really the volunteer aspect of things comes from the Walk for Hunger. That's right. Um, in a lot of ways. But I'm wondering if people who are watching are interested or, or, or engaged and galvanized by the conversation, um, is there you know, beyond the walk, and, you know, we should not, this is not to minimize that, but mm -hmm. is there any, you know, thing that, that people can do or ways that they can get involved that would be helpful? Yes. Um, so the development person in me has to say donate. Um, and, and I, and I think that right now, you know, it's been really, um, encouraging and, and like makes you feel good about humanity to see the outpouring of support. Mm -hmm. um and and i think that um what's critical and and particularly important from individuals who are contributing whether it's five dollars or five hundred dollars is that a lot of organizations that is money 
um, that gives flexibility to be able to react. Um, you know, some some funding that comes in in other ways is, you know, sort of restricted to a specific program or a specific mm -hmm. geographic region. And obviously, like, that's great, too. We take that money. But, but in the crisis response mode, we really do need flexibility because things are changing so rapidly. Um, so, so every, uh, I think every dollar it, that comes particularly from individuals is really helpful. Um, but on the sort of more action side, I think there's a number of things people can do. Um, social media is an easy one. You know, Project Bread is constantly promoting the resources that are available to others and, and getting the word out is hard. It's hard to break through um, messaging and and it right now in particular right because there's so much and so getting um the available resources in as many um in front of as many people as possible and, and networks as possible is, is really important um project red also has an action team so um this is a group that have raised their hands to say that they're interested in policy um and you know receive a newsletter where we sometimes say hey can you call your elected officials and say that you support this um, and, and provide some education there. So that's another way. And then you touched on the Walk for Hunger. And unfortunately, obviously, we had to cancel the event this year. You know, it brings thousands of people together. Thousands. Thousands. Um, and it's a really powerful, I mean, you said you've, you've done it. Um, yep. So thank you for I that. Was, but I was mentioning to my producing colleague before we went on the air that uh, 20 miles seems like a long time, but or a long way but when you do it um you know i've done i did the full 20 a couple of times and congrats didn't feel <laughs> didn't didn't feel that way you know you just have so yeah. many people around you it's a it's a special morning a lot of the you know a lot of the time it really is so anyway oh we'd love to hear that yeah and i mean i think the other thing that kind of is relevant to what we've been talking about about the walk is that because the walk kind of grew out of um a grassroots movement and had as much to do with awareness and and raising you know forcing people not forcing people but like helping to put that food insecurity piece out in front of people um back 50 years ago means that now that's still part of what we're doing and and a lot of amazing events in boston are strictly fundraising based and and the walk for hunger is certainly that for us mm -hmm. um fundraising piece is important but we've made the conscious decision you know we don't have a fundraising minimum um you for those who um, can't afford to pay a registration fee like we make concessions it's free to people 18 and under when it when it happens um it's free to everybody right now to do it virtually um and and so i think part of the beauty of the walk and part of that experience is really that it brings a, a good cross-section of um, all of the best parts of, of our city and our state together. And so, you know, as an organization, um, I think it's been challenging to, to know that we're not going to have um, that opportunity to, to be together as a community. And so um, when those decisions were first made, in full transparency, it was hard, you know, it's like grieving. Um, and so I think that, um, our, what we've done is kind of switch focus and um, try to use this as an opportunity when people feel really isolated to, to leverage the walk to bring people together. So we've had people doing, you know, steps challenges with their neighbor while everyone's mm -hmm. social distancing. Um, we've had people doing virtual bake sales and doing other, you know, uh, kind of challenges through mm -hmm. all of the means that we're communicating. And that's been so powerful. Um, so I think, you know, encouraging people to still um, use the walk and, and I should say that obviously this year we've made some changes to the way that the money raised through the walk will be used. We're putting it um, directly to COVID-19 response work, um, whereas in years past, you know, uh, after the walk, we, we granted out to a number of organizations. Um, that period of, of uh, review and, and holding out um, to make sure that you know, we have all the applications and everything has been um, eliminated. Basically. Right, right. So it's coming in, we're getting it back out. 
Right. And that's what generally happens with the money that comes in, you're saying, through the walk yep. which is, as we know, a big haul. Yeah. Um, and um, so then you guys redistribute that to local organizations. Um, yep. How far is the scope of the organizations that you are supporting and, and working with? Does it go all the way out to Western Mass, wider New England? Is it mostly a, an Eastern Mass, Boston-based thing? You know, how, how, how far do you go? We are statewide. Okay. True and true. I mean, I think um, what we are, what we look at um, from a funding perspective is um, is where's there the most need. And you know, this year we've launched, or last year we piloted, and this year launched a program where organizations can leverage the walk to fundraise for themselves, and they get to retain um, sixty percent mm -hmm. of of what they raise, which um, means that we can, you know the money that is um, raised elsewhere can go to the communities in the state that don't have that kind of um, capacity within their own community to, to fundraise. Um, and so we're really right. focused that's on- That's a great situation. That's in, that's yeah, that's yeah. It's been, I mean, it's, it's new and it's been a change, but there's been a really positive response to it. And we were kind of worried about, you know, what would happen because this is its official launch. And, and it's actually, um, it's been great. It's been an important part and, and people are really rallying around this and um, we're, we're excited and encouraged to see it and think it will be lasting. That's great. Hey, before we wrap up, I just did want to ask you, you had mentioned before about, you know, getting the word out around resources, et cetera, always a challenge and very important part of what you're doing. So let me give you a chance before we end um, <laughs> just to cover anything that we haven't covered or, and or, talk about um, uh, and let us know about any resources that have not been mentioned just yet. Sure, so I think from a, I'm biased, but um, from mm -hmm. a re resource perspective, part of what Project Bread um, does and kind of part of why we exist is uh, to be that central hub of resources for folks who need support. Um, and so, the best way to to see the full suite of resources available is by going to projectred.org uh, and backslash COVID-19. Um, and I think that um, there is a list of everything that's available um, as well as our partners. There's a map of where you can get free meals mm -hmm. for kids. Um, there's information about the various federal nutrition programs and some of the other supports happening. So that's definitely a place um, to send people. It's also um, for people who want to better understand what the hunger crisis that we're up against now looks like. Um, it's, it's a good way to, to get more information. So I think um, just as the general public, the some of the most important work is raising the awareness. So, I, you know, you made a really um, important comment before that there is a lot of uh, there are like a lot of different front lines and I think there are a lot of different um, crises that are coming out of this. Um, and so just helping people remember um, that uh, hunger is, is one of those and, and in particular hunger is important from an equity standpoint. Um, and, and so just keeping that top of mind and, and helping to you know, engage those around you um, to be thinking that that way as well um, and then obviously promoting resources and um, we certainly would love to have anyone um, who's interested in supporting to to join the virtual walk um, with us and um, start a fundraising page and and you know like I said it's free to do and, and every dollar counts and, and every dollar is going to um, support communities who really need the help right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time today, but also for the work that you are doing and facilitating and that Project Bread is doing. It is seriously important work and it is to our collective benefit all the, always and especially now. So thanks. James, thank you so much. This has been a really a real pleasure. Um, I love getting the chance to talk about this and um, it's so great to, to speak to someone who clearly is equally committed to the community. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have been speaking to Elizabeth Greenhall, who is uh, Project Bread's Vice President of Communications and Development. And you have been watching 
Million Dollar Gift. I'm James Milan. Thanks for joining us. Yeah.